Normally, right about now is when I would say something like, today, it's all about mastering light, or today, it's all about seeing the light or telling the story. And while each one of those is appropriate for the guest that I have on today, none of them actually fully describe the photographer and artist that is Joe McNally. This is Behind the Shot. Hi, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel. As always, the show notes for today's show are at BehindTheShot.tv. As well, there are links there at the blog post at BehindTheShot.tv. If you're watching on YouTube, the links are also right down below the subscribe and like button. So make sure you head down, check out any links, follow our guest, all of that type of stuff you normally would do. I want to jump right in today because today is going to be I have the feeling a long episode because, man, do I have questions. Photojournalist, an advertising, commercial, portrait, and basically everything photographer, it's Nikon Ambassador Joe McNally. Joe, how are you? Fine. How are you doing, Steve? I'm doing really good. It's good to see you again. We've met once before uh, through a thing we did when the pandemic first started with Skip Cohen, his F64 lunch bunch. And yes. I, I've wanted to get you on this show for so long because to say I'm a fan of your work, to say I'm a fan of how you educate, uh, and most importantly, I would argue I'm a fan of kind of the way you you mentally seem to approach things. Uh, so again, thanks for being here. I, I, I started this conversation by kind of listing off 9 million different photographic genres. You seem to be able to photograph and do photograph almost everything. So I'm curious when someone on the street walks up to you and says, Oh, you're a photographer. What do you shoot? What the hell do you answer? Well, yeah, no, that's a, it's a good question. And it's a good way to start. Cause you know, I've not to the man on the street, but to folks in the industry, if, um, you know, asked or pressed, I kind of just describe myself as a journalist and it, comes from really uh, the education I had, which was sort of designed to turn me into a newspaper photographer. And I did work for newspapers and wire services when I first hit uh, New York City and tried to start a career. And then from thence, I went into magazines and color, and then uh, other things happened along the way. I've always been a big fan of uh, a versatile photographer, someone who can jump into a lot of scenarios. Plus, it also helps you make a living, you know? You can do a variety of things, and uh, sometimes, you know, photo editors, they throw up their hands. At National Geographic, you know, there's sometimes a story comes down the pike that has a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Journalism, portraiture, concept photography, illustration, whatever it might be, science, technology, and they just say, whoa. And, you know, I oftentimes got that call, you know, fix this, shoot it, solve the problem. Which, okay, so you just touched on two things I got to go deeper on. I recently had a, a gentleman by the name of Sam Abel on, who was a Nat Geo photographer as well. And Sam was kind of the same way in that what he was photographing was photojournalistic and he approached it photojournalistically. But what he was photographing hands down was environmental portraiture at the same time. They often you know cross over. And same with the guest that's current as we're recording this, David Bergman, who started in journalism in Miami, ended up moving to New York and can pretty much shoot everything. When you, when you, when you reach the level that you're at, affiliations start coming in. And the one that always stands out to me with you is that you're a Nikon ambassador, which is a rare, rare group of people. We're talking my buddy Moose Peterson, Troy, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Todd Young, who shoots what I shoot. Um, Deb Sandage, Matthew Jordan Smith, the list goes on and on. There's there's a number of them. When when you look at the company that you're in, right? I mean, you're at the top of it, but when you look at the company that you're in, what does a program like that mean to you, A? And more importantly, what do you think a program like that means to the photography community? Both good questions. Uh, first of all, I'm very proud to be a Nikon ambassador and be in the group that I am. We share you know, a lot of information, strengths, uh, passion, interests, direction, all of that stuff. We're able to feed back to Nikon, hopefully effectively, like what's going on out here, what we would like to see in cameras, et cetera. And, you know, along the way, you start to see that, that stuff coming out in the various cameras that they'll introduce. But I guess, Steve, really, you know, when I, when I jumped into this industry and I, I wanted to be a photographer, I knew that, you know, as soon as I picked up a camera, I think really, I wanted to try to do good work 
and in the course of doing so, uh, be respected by my peers. Uh, back in the day, you know, and we're talking really back in the day when it comes to me, because I've been at this for a long time, uh, there was a term that uh, photographers used to use, and it was, uh, if you called somebody a pro's pro, that meant they could do anything with a camera. And, you know, I saw that example. I was lucky enough to, to uh, be mentored by some really, really powerful photographers and also be associated with Life magazine early in my career. And Carl Maidens, you know, was still there. You know, uh, it, it wasn't working all that much. But uh, Ralph Morse, you know, taught us all how to shoot a space launch when the space shuttle program started. Gordon Parks would be up in the hallways. I mean, and these were photographers who really could do anything with a camera. I thought, well, you know, I want to work. And that seems like a cool thing to do to jump from this genre into this genre and just say, yes, yeah, I can do that. So that was um, a very powerful thing early in my career. So, okay. So as a young photographer, because each of the people that you just mentioned is a legend in and of their own right, right? As a young photographer walking the hallway, seeing people like that, uh, that's the equivalent of a musician being starstruck when they meet, you know, artist X. I find that interesting. But you said you wanted to be a photographer as soon as you picked up a camera. So you knew that think, quick? How, how? I think I knew. How? I think I knew. Yeah. You know, it felt right in my hands. I mean, I was in journalism school at Syracuse wow. University. I was um, studying to be uh, a writer. You know, I thought, well, you know, I was a wannabe athlete when I was younger. And I thought, well, maybe I could become a sports writer and therefore maintain contact with that world that I really, um, you know, enjoyed, you know, to try to participate in, you know, as a basketball nut when I was a kid. But uh, as a matter of course, I was required to take a photography class at the Newhouse School. And as soon as... I picked up a camera and I borrowed my dad's old camera. It's a Beauty Light 3. I still have it. Uh, and I started shooting pictures. I, I started living in the dark room. I could not believe the magic of a print coming up and translating what you had seen into this physical object sitting there in developer. I, I, I was totally smitten. Which I still would argue. I the the one downside to me of today is I mean sitting behind me is is a Canon Pro One Thousand. There is something beautiful about a print in your hand, but man, to to pick up a camera and know what you want to do right away is such kind of a special gift. I think, uh, which leads you to a number of of affiliations. You're an ambassador for Capture One. You're a Gitzo ambassador. You're affiliated with Adorama through Printique. Synology, which I've got a new Synology sitting behind me, Last the Light, Tether Tools, PowerX. Your career has led you down so many roads, seemingly to me on the outside at least, kind of building up to where you are today. You've been to 70 different countries through through assignments. You photographed, you mentioned Life and you mentioned Nat Geo, but Sports Illustrated, which is that sports history of yours coming back in, Time, Newsweek, Fortune, uh, your clients, obviously Nikon, the, the shot we're going to be talking about today is, is was shot for Nikon, FedEx, Sony, ESPN, Adidas, Mac Cosmetics. When I when I look at that list, there's that variety, right? FedEx, Sony, bit, ESPN, yeah. Nikon, Adidas, Epson. Okay, Mac Cosmetics. Yeah, there's that every American Ballet Theater, which my understanding is, I heard another interview with you where you mentioned you've shot dance for a long time. So here's the question related to your client and and job list. Has there been any job or client for that matter that after doing that job or working with your client, that client influenced your, your work afterwards? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. The editors, art directors, he work uh, for, you know, uh, I mean, a very powerful influence on me was John Longard. Uh, he was a wonderful photographer, became the DOP at life. He was tough. You know, very could be very acerbic, you know, and pointed in his criticism and his direction of you. But I learned, you know, and his influence on me was palpable to this day. In fact, I just wrote a new book called The Real Deal, and there's a small chapter in there 
about photographing people's hands. And that was one of Lowengard's things. He always said that the hands were on his shot list because the hands can tell a powerful story of how someone has lived their life. Uh, likewise, FedEx, you know, when I shot for FedEx, the art director wanted everything off the cuff, angles, stuff that could be blown out, autofocus, uh, excuse me, out of focus. Um, you know, just she wanted the campaign to look like you were walking down the street and just kind of had a point and shoot and a FedEx truck whizzed by and you just went click like that, which was really counter to the way I had been educated, like rule of thirds, keep everything sharp, you know, <laughs> that right. sort of thing. And, uh, it kind of loosened me up, you know, and so I think it's uh, still as present in my work to a degree where I can kilter things. I'm more comfortable being a little bit looser at the camera. And that's definitely an influence of people I've worked for over the years. That's Those are both amazing lessons, actually. And what's interesting is I never I don't think I ever consciously thought about the hands thing. But like when I've photographed Muay Thai or, or martial, you know, mixed martial arts or, or something like that. I often love photographing a close-up of the hands after they're taped and signed by by the ref. Um, so that you know that that is interesting to me because it's true. We talk about oh that that gentleman's face has character, but hands, calluses or lack thereof, uh, have have an amazing amount of character. That's those are really good lessons. Plus the 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 FedEx example I find fascinating because. You know, we always talk about the fact that a sharp, or at least I always talk about the fact, a sharp blurry shot, uh, or excuse me, a sharp blurry shot. I don't even know what that means. A sharp noisy shot is always better than a clean blurry shot where you were afraid to raise the ISO to get the shutter speed that you really needed. But in truth, it really depends on what the end use model is going to be. What's the client need? What's the story that you're trying to tell? Yeah, horizons are best when they're level, but a Dutch angle at the right time adds something to a shot too. Uh, you were the first ever recipient of the Alfred Eisenstadt Award for Journalistic Impact. It was for a, a life coverage that you did titled The Panorama of War. You were named and listed by American Photo as one of the 100 most important people in photography. And Photo District News in a in a industry-wide survey there, you were voted one of the top 30 influential photographers. All of that to me, everything we've discussed kind of lists the Joe McNally that I think of from the outside. But where my first real introduction to you came was at a Photoshop world where you were doing a keynote. And I will tell you right up front, I sat in that audience thinking, oh, I can't wait to watch Joe McNally do a keynote. This is going to be absolutely amazing. And when you were done, I think it was in my head. It's entirely possible I said out loud, no, don't, no, it can't be over. Because your speaking style and your ability to tell stories verbally and, and photographically are absolutely amazing. So... As an educator, is there, is there a reason that you think you're so natural at it? I own your Language of Light DVD. Uh, apparently, there's a volume two I didn't know about. I own volume one. Uh, I've seen your classes at Kelby One and at Creative Live. Is there something about education that you think just clicks in you? Again, good question. I mean, you know, all those things you said earlier, Stephen, really that all that stuff really means I've been doing this a really long time <laughs> and, and I've had my bumps and bruises. It's a very human thing to do to be a photographer. It is about human relationships. And, you know, those vary day to day. The jobs vary from day to day. And I think it stems from uh, you know, when I, I speak or lecture or teach, I think it stems from, again, harking back to my early days when I was mentored. And these photographers took the time and had the confidence to tell me what to do, like secrets, you know, or not that there are secrets, but, you know, they were very, very confident in their own abilities, enough so to help out someone else. And I've always been comfortable and enjoyed the photo community and the company of photographers. We share a lot of the same strengths and weaknesses, 
we go through a lot of the same stuff. And so I find that uh, that thing that we have that you know we share among each other, and it's, it's now gotten even bigger. Conventions, as you mentioned, Kelby, etc. Back in the day, prior to the internet, it was the photographers all coming back to the wet dark room at the end of a day and giving each other a lot of grief, you know, and then going out for beers afterwards. You know, so it's evolved right over time. But the the uh, company of photographers is something that I really do feel is 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 a powerful thing and an enjoyable thing. Yeah, the community we, we it really is the the creative community as a whole is is amazing. You mentioned your book. You have a book coming out February eighth. This show I think is going to launch two days before that, which is the sixth. It's called the Real Deal. Field notes uh, from the life of a working photographer. Tell us about the book a little bit. Sure, uh, you know it was a long time coming, <laughs> for sure. Uh, Rocky Nook is the publisher, and they're very patient. My editor Ted Waite is wonderful and patient because I signed the contract uh, to do the book maybe five years prior to actually writing it. The pandemic played into it. You know, I was all of a sudden I was off the road and at home, and I had some time, and I dug into it finally. So it's not a how-to book. You know, there's a lot of photo books out there that have a destination, a specific de destination, like posing people better, or maybe a Photoshop book or something along those lines that really has a clear, you know, read the book and you'll know how to do this kind of uh, approach, which is wonderful. This is not that. It's not a straight line. It's more of a country road. My editor and I kind of you know, embrace that term. Uh, it winds through the career of a working photographer and the ups and downs thereof. There's a lot of lessons in there. There's a lot of information. It's presented anecdotally, not analytically. It's not f-stops and shutter speeds, though there's a few of them in there for sure. It's about approach. It's about uh, the relationships you develop. It's about the insecurities. It's about the process. It's about finding light, uh, speaking with light, caring for your subjects. Uh, those things are very, very important, you know, to wrap around all the technical stuff that we, uh, frankly, are, are pretty well inundated with as photographers. So I've pre-ordered this book. This is one of those books that as soon as I saw what it was and the description that you just gave, and the fact that you just mentioned it includes preparing for your subjects, which is so important to me as a music photographer. I research every band I'm going to photograph before I photograph them. Definitely a book I'm dying to get. It's available on Rocky Nook and Amazon. Links to both are in the show notes over at BehindTheShot.tv. Is there a, a preferred place that people should buy it that, that does better for you? <laughs> sure. Rocky Nook is is uh, a great place to buy the book. Nothing wrong with Amazon or Barnes & Noble or any of those places, but uh, Rocky Nook is close to home, you know, close to my heart. You know, I have good friends there. And certainly my editor, Ted, uh, is a wonderful friend and a very, very intelligent editor. You know, he really uh, can shape a direction almost kind of without you really knowing it, you know, just conversationally like, well, maybe you know, you should go and, you know, and then it's so subtle on his part at the end of the conversation, you're like, wow, I'm glad I thought of that. You know, <laughs> well, it wasn't really you at all. <laughs> and so, and by the way, they have a lot of good photo books at Rocky Nook. Scott Kelby's got books there. My buddy, Alan Hess has, has books through Rocky Nook as well. So I want to get into some general photography questions before we pull up this photograph. Uh, because as I knew you were going to be on, and I see you as a photographer, as a creative, you know, in a certain way, I often see what is technically a great photo. It's sharp. It may even be composed and have really nice, strong composition. But there's no story for the viewer to latch on to, right? It's, it's a blob on the wall. Even though it's technically executed beautifully, it ends up being a blob on the wall. Whereas you have this ability, which I've alluded to before, uh, you have this ability to tell a story, I would argue, better than almost anybody else. I, I actually described you once. This is really a tangent, so bear with me. I described you to somebody once like a, a Bruce Springsteen of photography. You have the ability to see 
and capture the average real world person and tell their story with an amount of respect I think doesn't happen a lot. So my question for you is, do you have any tips for people on getting from a technically good photograph to a good story? Sure. And you're being very kind, Steve. I, you know, I mean, you know, Springsteen. I mean, that's I mean, if air, you break into you know? Born to Run right now, that may sidetrack it a little bit, but I'm just saying. Yeah. Not going to do that. We do not want to hear me sing. Um, but yes, I think respect and care for your subjects, knowledge thereof, research, as you mentioned, you know, is extremely important. But I've always told young photographers that, uh, you know, beyond the f-stops and shutter speeds, you know, if you're in the studio or wherever, you know, and I use the analogy if you're using flash, I said in the flash of those lights, there's a an agreement being formed. Uh, there's a bond. There's a, a certain level of trust. Certainly that subject is placing their trust in you because being in front of a camera, especially if you're an average Joe, you know, um, is not, not a comfortable place. It's a very vulnerable place to be. And you have to understand and respect that, you know. So I'm not saying every photo uh, assignment results in a relationship. It doesn't happen. Some are cursory. Some are, you know, monetary kind of, you know, driven, you know, a corporate annual report being, you know, all that sort of stuff. All fine. Pays the bills. But the best assignments are ones where there is an understanding. There is a glimpse of your subject's heart and mind. You know, Eddie Adams always used to say that the best photographs are ones that re just reach inside your rib cage and rip your heart out, which is pretty powerful words. But I do know that, for instance, at National Geographic, to get a photograph in that magazine, the photograph had to fire on three pistons, at least. Uh, it had to be pictorially successful, you know, look good. It had to be informationally successful, had to move the reader down the road in terms of the story, you know, propel them along in the context of the story. And it had to be emotionally involving, had to involve the reader's heart and mind. And those are the best photographs. And those only come from kind of a deep dive with your subject. You're all in together, you know, and if your subject is at risk in front of the lens, you have to be at risk behind the lens. You have to take that step. You have to you know, be emotionally involved yourself. So it's a two way street. Okay. But, but while each individual subject is different to, to a certain extent, subjects repeat, there, there are certain subjects or scenarios or environments that you've seen many times before and you have to go photograph again. So mm -hmm. when you go to a shoot that is something in some way or another you've seen before, how, how do you see it with fresh eyes? Again, you know, good question. Um, sometimes I don't, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh man, I come away from a shoot and I thought I could have done better. I should have done better. Why can't I see better? You know, sometimes you have those days, but I do try to find a story. You know, there is a mantra and it was drilled into me early in my career and I repeat it in my head when I'm on location. What is the story? What is the story? What is the story? And I have another mantra that follows along with that. Entire to detail. Entire to detail. You have to show your your viewer, your reader, everything, and then drill, 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 drill. Mel Scott at Life Magazine always said that um, it was like peeling an onion, doing a story. You find layers and you just keep peeling and peeling and peeling until you get to the core of the matter. So, yeah, it's a process. It's not cursory. It really isn't. You know, the best, there's, there's no secret. The best stories, the richest coverages stem directly from or have a connection to time spent, you know, right. with your subject. Okay. So... Last question, and then we're going to bring the image up. And and this one, I'm just kind of curious. With somebody like a Joe McNally, all creatives, I think, all photographers, have a desire to continue to grow and learn and expand their process. So what does continuing education look like for Joe McNally? Oh, wow. Um, uh, you know, uh, I I like, like, that's a 
ridiculous word. I, I really enjoy, involve myself, enrich my life by looking at uh, a lot of photographs, you know, different photographers, uh, you know, from days gone by as well as new talents. You know, uh, I, I look at what other people do, what they're, per, you know, putting out, you know, and I said, geez, you know, you know what the, again, uh, harking back to my beginnings, you know what the best praise I can think of for another photographer or the job that those photographers shot or the pictures that they produced was to look at the photograph and go, I wish I shot that. Right. You know? That's high praise indeed. I said I to I, uh, I said to Moose when he was on the show, and we were we were doing oddly a moose photograph, and I said to him, "I feel like I'm standing there looking at this moose." And he said, "That's the highest praise I can get is that you feel like you're you're in the scene." So before we get into today's shot, just a reminder for everybody: this photograph, a small gallery of Joe's work, to give you kind of a sample, and all of Joe's links are available at the website BehindTheShot.tv. Also, all the subscribe opportunities that you have. The video is on YouTube, of course, but the podcast itself is available wherever you get your podcasts, in audio only, or if your podcast outlet of choice supports video, it's also available in video format and whichever one you want, you know, up to you. Again, YouTube is an option for you there as well. I do want to say thanks to DVE Store for the HD video. You can visit dvestore.com for all of your digital video equipment needs. And last but not least, just a reminder, I do actually have a photo workshop coming up in April. It's at Princeton Photo Workshop. And uh, if you want details on that, you can just head on over to princetonphotoworkshop.com. And with that, let's get into today's image. So for today's image, I don't know where to start. I think I tweeted something to the effect when you first said you were gonna be on the show, that this is the most complex image I have ever had on this show. I'm calling it high fashion heist. Is there a name for this photo? Yeah, you got it right there. We called it the heist. And when I wrote the treatment for it, I believe the title that I sent to the creatives was a museum heist exclamation point. Okay. So I'm going to do something that I do on every show here and bear with me if I butcher this or at the end, feel free to yell at me or say whatever. But for the audio audience, I describe the photo. It's a wonderful exercise. I think everybody should try and do is take photos and try and describe them verbally because you start seeing things. This photo, yeah, not a chance in hell. So let's, <laughs> let's start here. It's landscape orientation. I don't have them on screen, but you can't see. Joe is, Joe is laughing right now. Uh, it's landscape orientation. It's an old museum in Budapest. And I, when I say old museum, I don't mean old as in decrepit, right? I mean, it's old and it is beautiful and it is ornate. And we are standing in a position where to our left, camera left, there is a wide grand staircase. And again, this is this reminded me of the Library of Congress building or... Uh, the Boston Public Library, and that it's just beautiful, you know, stone everywhere. In front of you, right in front of you, there are two statuesque busts. One of them very close to you on a shorter pedestal. One of them a little bit farther on a higher pedestal away. And those busts are being knocked over. More on that in a minute. In the background, on the opposite side of the stairs, there is a security guard sitting at the desk, asleep, elbow kind of like this, head in his hands. He's frame right on the bottom right third, okay? And there's a red velvet rope behind him showing he's a security guard, that you can't go certain places. That's a perfect part of the story that adds so much to what that person at the desk is doing, right? There is beautiful light everywhere. The alcoves in the ceiling from outside the window, interestingly enough. And there is a woman seemingly running down the stairs with a handful of jewels. She is in a beautiful gown. I mean, like ballroom type gown. Her dress flying up behind her. And her dress is what knocked that one higher statue and pedestal over. Her expression looking back over her right shoulder is that of surprise. She realizes what she did, like she's going to get caught because she's stealing the, the jewelry. And I mentioned this earlier. 
the image is askew. It's a Dutch angle leaning down to the right, the way that she's running, which by the way, to me is key because almost if this image were horizontal, I'd lose her momentum. If it were tilted the other way, I'd lose her momentum. This gives her a place to run into, a reason to run, and adds the tension of the moment. But I have to say something here. The lighting in this image is something like a, a lighting director on a movie set or a cinematographer would do. The lighting here is absolutely insanely good. Like, I don't even know where to start with it. So let's go here. You mentioned to me that in the book, The Real Deal, when we were going back and forth picking the image, that this leads off a chapter in the book. I've got some yep. behind the scenes image images that all kind of show as you're talking, but explain to me this shoot, why it leads off a chapter. Sure. I, I, I use it as a prompt to a chapter. The title of the chapter is uh, write with light, which is what we do as photographers, but first write on paper. And in this chapter, I'm encouraging photographers, especially young photographers to really hone their writing skills, which sounds kind of like, hey, wait a minute, aren't we supposed to be talking about photography? But to create proposals, uh, to write for blogs, to write for your social media, you have to really be coherent about it and imaginative and really make sense. You know, it's not easy to separate a client from their money <laughs> at this point in time. Assignments don't drop from trees. So if you can write effectively and convincingly and give the client, whoever that client is, reason to say, okay, yeah, this sounds good. We're going to fund this process. That starts with the written word, not so much uh, the picture because you ha don't have the picture in hand yet. Okay. So this image, according to you, you sent me a link to a behind the scenes video, which I have a link to in the show notes behind the shot.tv. And you sent me a couple of behind the scenes images, which again, as, as you kind of describe this, uh, I'm going to put up on screen periodically, but this is a huge production. Like this is, when I think photo shoot, I don't think cranes. I don't think a crew of 30 to 40. I'm not sure I'd know where to go with 30 or 40 people. Uh, lighting 30,000 watt seconds of light. Explain what this image was and kind of how, how this came about. Yeah. Well, it came about basically because I've seen way too many James Bond movies. Um, and so I had this whole idea of the elegant lady leaving the party, having stolen the gem. She's a, an elegant cat burglar. It's just a, a, a piece of, you know, fun or silliness, however you want to characterize it. It was maybe a paragraph of writing, and but the client loved it. And ball started rolling, you know, wheels started turning. And then we ended up in Budapest. And I knew what I was getting into. Um, I didn't completely factor on how many people would actually be in attendance, but I knew what I was getting into because uh, I lit big things before. I've done a lot of production work for National Geographic and for Sports Illustrated. So I didn't really have, you know, I wasn't terrified of the the nature of the physical space. I, I felt I could probably light that. Uh, I was more concerned about the talent, the gesture, the immediacy of it, and also how to make a statue look like it's falling over without actually breaking it. Well, well, that's, so, that that was one of my questions actually coming up because there's there's a lot of stuff happening in here. Yeah. So she's trying to escape with the gems. Her gown knocks over the statue. The guard is asleep, but obviously he's about to wake up because the statue is in mid position as it's starting to head to the floor. The museum is a working museum, the Museum of Ethnography in Budapest, was a phenomenally beautiful place. Uh, we could only work there starting about eight o'clock at night and working through until six or seven the next morning. So I had to light the whole place and I had to make it feel like there was maybe some golden light in the late part of the day streaming in the windows. So which there, there's no lights to, in the museum to light it up? Or just not, not uh, well, with this they, artistic architectural light? Yeah, not it, it, not punchy enough, not uh, not necessarily always in the right place. Uh, so yes, your first instinct, well, I can just drag my shutter and burn in the museum. But I also had to get, uh, I had to freeze gesture 
so my my exposure couldn't be too long. And I was hemmed in by some ISO issues, just in the sense that I didn't I, the the richness of the shot stems from the detail of it, and I didn't want to push this to stratospheric ISOs. So uh, you know, you just want it to be like you know tight. You want it to to really be sharp and beautiful and have a luster to it, the same way the museum did. So. Yeah, so it led me to trucking in a lot of lights. We uh, we couldn't support it from Budapest. They trucked in all the lighting from Munich. It was all pro photo. And then with accents with Nikon speed lights here and there, believe it or not. So the large and the small of it, you know, on the set at the same time. Like those statues you mentioned that are up front, those are just lit with speed lights, just little key lights on the, the visage of the sculpture. But the big, the heavy lifting was done by um, Pro 10 lights, uh, 2,400 watt second lights, a bunch of them on a crane outside, running power to that, triggering it, all that sort of stuff ensued. So, okay. This is this is a D850 shot for the D850 campaign for Nikon. Mm-hmm. Do you remember your exposure on the final shot? Could you wager Oof. a guess? Sure. I think, you know, I needed to have some depth. I believe it's a 14, 24 millimeter lens. As you say, it's kind of kicked a little bit at a dynamic angle on a tripod. And I'm going to say ISO 200 to 400, somewhere's in there. Maybe uh, maybe 5.6 to F8 because I needed some depth. You know, if, if you give me a minute while we're kind of chatting here, I can maybe pull it up. I might be able to find the metadata for it and be more precise. Uh, that, that's all right. Uh, you know, you just mentioned the the Dutch angle, and then it's you know kicked to the right. What was your thinking on that? Well, it's very uh, much in line with what you mentioned the the tension and the drama of the photograph. I kind of tipped the camera to accentuate the momentum. She's stri- trying to get the hell out of there, you know, right. and she's running. That's the gesture is that she's. She's taking that giant step, you know, and we're hitting her with a fan. And I mean, what you don't see in the photograph is um, because of the coloration that was chosen for the gown, it's a beautiful gown, but the cape, uh, the flow of it was kind of heavy material. So we couldn't really make it do what it's doing there with just wind machines. So there's two grips offset with large boom poles. And fishing line. Oh. And so this monofilament line tacked to the gown. And when I called action, they would flip it. You know, they would just flip the their boom poles and get this fluttery effect of the gown, which was accentuated by the fan. But if we just had fans, it never would have worked. Okay. But the dress is also that, that train that you're throwing up in the air also has silver aspects to it, which becomes a specular highlight issue. I realize mm-hmm. you're a master of light. You see light better than most people I've ever met. But you walk into a scene like this. Like for example, the video that you sent me in advance, the, the behind the scenes video, which again, folks, go watch it. It's fascinating to watch. It's, the link is at the, in the show notes. But you're, it, part of that video shows you scouting the location and taking some shots mm-hmm. ahead of time. Are yeah. you thinking... At that point in time, are you already picturing where the speed lights are going to be, where the different lights are going to be? Because again, this is so complex. I, I guess what I don't understand is how are you mapping all of these light locations and power and the the issues? For example, the speed lights on the statues is just so spot on. The front one's slightly darker. The back one looks like it's falling into a spotlight from the ceiling. Right, like it's falling from where it was under a, a natural ceiling light. Are, are, how are you mapping the locations and power and the specular highlight stuff in your head during scouting, or are you? Yeah, I am. Um, Pre visualization is a big factor with a shot like this. You can't walk in as a blank slate. You know, I'm shooting scouting photographs, and I had you know images sent to me before I showed up on location, and then. Uh, I started the sketch, you know, for the crew where I thought the lighting grid should, you know, be placed. And oddly enough, you know, you know, you can light the foreground. Like I've lit a human being up for before, right up close to the camera. 
I know I can do that. So I kind of worked the lighting problem from the back of the photograph to the front because the key light, if you will, or that's the wrong term. It wouldn't be the key light or the dominant light source was really the light blowing through the windows up top. I had to make the museum come alive. It couldn't go dead up in those alcoves. It's an accent and light. And then, light, yeah. Yes, it's an accent light that happens to be about 15,000 watt seconds. <laughs> you know? Wow. So, you know, um, so yeah, so you, you have that as a, as a blast. And then you start looking at the dead spots and dropping lights in 2400s. I think we used Profoto 7Bs. Uh, that were available to us on a rental basis, uh, grids, gels. And then you keep working your way forward, like the guard, the sleeping guard. Well, what would that monitor on his desk, what kind of light would that produce? It would be kind of greenish. So there's gels there. And you try to go with the um, the coloration of the museum, but also accent what pieces of your imagination were you know, written up before you actually show it on the location. The sleeping security guard, even though he's small in the frame, is a crucial piece of the puzzle. Well, okay. But most of that's happening before you're ever on scene. That's what blows my mind is that that you have this, I would argue, natural ability to to see those lights in your head. I need one there. I need one there. I need a gel there. But you you mentioned I started from the background forward, which is the next point I want to make that I didn't really allude to when I described the shot, and I probably should have. This shot is layer upon layer upon layer. There there are the traditional you know foreground, midground, background in a landscape. Take that, multiply by ten, right? Where the staircase is, where the one statue is compared to the second statue, compared to the thief, compared to the desk. Again, the velvet rope, I would argue, is key here to let you know it's not just a guy sitting at a desk, but probably security with with a rope up there. The layers and the light add to all of this. Are you thinking in layers at the same time as lighting, or are you... Are you going and scouting and thinking light, and then later, as you sit down and start sketching, you start think? Are, in other words, I guess, are you consciously? I'm rambling. Consciously adding layers for complexity. Do you even think that way? Yes, absolutely. I, I always call them uh, luxury items of light. You Ooh, know, I like that. Yeah, I'm a firm believer in lighting through a photograph because I've said this a hundred times. the The eye seeks pleasure. The eye is a hunter. And the more detail and nuance and subtlety and characterization and storyline you can offer your reader, your viewer, the longer they'll stay with the picture. So could I have just lit this lady up front with the falling statue? Sure. And let the museum go kind of dead in the background? Sure. But it would be less of an enjoyable picture personal opinion right you know you want somebody to stick with the photograph and kind of dive into it you know uh there's a uh, a sculpture kind of a piece of the wall directly above the security guard's head in the background well that's keyed with a Profoto 7b which is a fairly sizable light but i knew i couldn't let that uh that piece of delicate you know stonework go dead because then i'm cheating the reader you know, um, my ultimate customer is the person who views the photograph. You know, I'm working for a client to be sure, but down the road, you throw this out in the world, you want people to enjoy it. You know, it's not a serious piece of journalism or, you know, it's not a, um, you know, something that's part of a larger story that has, you know, implications in a news vein. It's really a piece of fluff. It's a fun thing to do. So you want people to just enjoy it. Like, oh, that's really cool. That would be the first reaction you'd, you'd like to get when people looked at the picture. There, there's little one, what I call one percenters in here. Those things that just make it 1% more than anything else you see. For example, the highlight that's on the pedestal that's falling. It's so controlled, right? And uh, somebody that I don't want to say you know, wasn't good, they may be great, but somebody that didn't think it through all the way would flash that it would bleed 
But the way you controlled it, again, makes it look like it's a natural ceiling light or something like that that happens to be hitting it as it's falling. Same with the reflection light on the floor between her feet. That, again, looks like a natural light reflection on the floor, not a flash that hit. And you talk about gesture, the fact that her front leg is visible from the gown and the knee is bent. All of this just so adds to this. Once you capture it, you take it into post. You're a Capture One ambassador now. But based on when this was shot for the D850, what would you have done to this image in post? <laughs> Do, do I want to know? Professional retouch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, I, I, uh, John Cospito, who's got on to become a wonderful photographer with his own business and his own right, did our, our retouching here in the studio. He was very good. He, he really enjoys retouching. So he was on location. So he saw the whole process. So the way we got the, uh, statue to fall was we braced it as they do in the movies with, um, a green colored brace you know, for green screen. That's not all that powerful for a still photographer. You know, I mean, you know, Game of Thrones was shot on green screen with all sorts of special effects. This just had a simple metal brace that cradled the statue and the stand in the tipping, uh, you know, angle of it. And so they just wrestled, excuse me, rested the, uh, the items or nestled them, maybe might is a, is a better way of saying it, in this bracing. And then we retouched that out afterwards. So you shot a That's you really, shot a plate without it falling and without the green brace. I did shoot some plates of uh, the floor, you know, because the um, the green brace is on the floor. So you want to replace that uh, that tile that's underneath there. But that area of the photograph is really that's it. You know, that's that's what we did to it. We we retouched out the bracing on the statue. Everything else is pretty much there. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, so the image is just brilliant. And and I don't know that clients ever say that sometimes to creatives. I know my clients sometimes send a note back saying, hey, love the, love the shots. A lot of times you don't hear back. I just got to tell you, shot, brilliant. So well done. So amazingly done. I want to do a speed round with you. And on the okay. speed round, just answer as fast as you can. Or if you need okay. to if you need to to trail on, go for that too. I'm game for anything. What is your okay. again, going back to the fact that you've got a mastery of light, what is your top lighting tip? Control. Uh, you know, it, it's easy to put up an umbrella and it looks fine, you know, uh, but to take it to the next step, you know, uh, the ability to light this but not that you know, to articulate light that becomes part of your language. And as you go forward with lighting, then your language gets more complex. Your narrative can become more mm. voluptuously rendered, if you will. You know, um, I, I ascribe very human adjectives to light. It can be angry. It can be frilly. It can be slashing. It can be nasty. Uh, it can be uh, electric, you know, all these things, you know, that uh, can be Baroque, it can be voluptuous, you know, all these wow, things. I love that. And I, you know, sometimes my assistants look at me when I'm on, on location, they're like, this guy's crazy. Um, but, you know, uh, light has, I believe, every quality or emotion, ha it has the emotional range of the written or spoken word. Think about it, you know. Uh, light gives your viewer a psychological roadmap to your photograph. By lighting this, but not that, you're sending a very powerful message to somebody you're never going to meet. You're saying, look here, but not so much here. So you're giving their eye a map to where you want them to go. And light is a powerful tool to do that. I, oh man. And, and again, I'm going to throw this out language of light DVD. There's a volume two. Now I've got the volume one. Uh, this is t the type of thing you get just amazing. Okay. Next question. You've been doing this for more than two years. Is there, <laughs> is there anybody from early on in your career that you didn't get to photograph and you wish you could have? Sure. Wow. I mean, lots of folks, 
you know, uh, I was blessed actually to photograph Sophia Loren. You know, that was that was an amazing thing. Um, yeah, gosh, my mind's a little bit of a jumble as I kind of reach back. You know, there was a situation. Uh, I had to give up the assignment. People magazine assigned me, and this burns in my head, to <laughs> photograph Gregory Peck. Oh, and I had to give it away because I had a commercial job and the commercial client refused to release me on that date. And then people turned around and assigned Harry Benson, who did a lovely job. But to have met Gregory Peck, I also had to give away an assignment. It wasn't of a person, but man, I still remember. Ugh. Again, it was a conflict of calendar. People Magazine wanted me to go to Richard Burton's hometown wow. in Wales and do a mood piece on where he came from after his death. I had to give that one away, too. Okay. Biggest mistake you almost made or did make? <sighs> now, that's a book unto itself, my mistakes. Um, <laughs> there we go. You know. Rocky Nook, here um, we come. Yes, yes. I, I've made mistakes uh, by not being more uh, aggressive. I mean, and when you use that term, you think, oh, you know, the photographer's being aggressive, jerk. I don't mean being a jerk. I mean just standing my ground. A couple of times I got steamrollered. I was younger. Uh, I photographed Cher, for instance. And um, she's nice, you know, and I got some good pictures of her, but she was also quite powerful. And she kind of rolled right over me. And I just backpedaled and I didn't have the gravitas to stand my ground as I would have now and just say, look, lady, you know, we got to do this picture and we got to do it now. Would you, you know? would you call it gravitas or would you call it a, uh, confidence? Both, both, yes. I mean, I think you accumulate gravitas as you gain experience and maybe as you age, you know? Right. Um, and then also, you also amp up your confidence the more jobs you shoot and the more road right. you travel, you know? Okay. Favorite composition rule, if any? Break it. Say that again? You know, break it. Look at the rules of composition and break them. Okay. Favorite album, song, or artist? Wow, I was just talking to somebody earlier today. Um, well, one of them, it would be Laura Nairo. Um, Going to take a miracle. Favorite drink? Red wine. Red wine. Okay. Any specific? Pinot, Cab? Uh, uh, Merlot. Merlot. Okay. Lovely. And final question. Any photographer out there, living or or not, that you think more people should know about and look up and learn oh, or follow? Wow. Yeah, I mean, I can uh, use a, a an example, two examples from two worlds. Um, photographer still living, Donald McCullen has a, an Instagram account that he posts on pretty regularly. He's a British war photographer and traveling photographer, member of Magnum. Uh, one of my favorite quotes came from him about a camera. He said, I only use a camera like I use a toothbrush. It gets the job done. That's a pretty beautiful thing to say in the midst of all the bells and whistles, which I'm very thankful for. Right. You know, no two ways about it. Um, but but he it's a tool. Is, uh, yeah, it's a tool. It's only as smart as you are, you know. Uh, but he has a formidable account. Gordon Parks is no longer with us, but there is an Instagram account, the Gordon Parks Foundation. And the evocative nature of Gordon's decency and humanity growing up as a photographer, uh, as a black photographer, at a time where that road had to be enormously difficult to travel. His talent, his graciousness, and his creativity superseded everything. And one of the proudest moments I ever had was I assisted Gordon for a day uh, up on the streets of Harlem. We 
he was assigned by Life magazine to recreate Art Kane's original photograph, A Great Day in Harlem. And Life went out and found the survivors who were on that stoop that day, even, re- even down to the little boy who was sitting on the curb. They found him obviously grown into man and collected, you know, had all these folks come back in and say, hey, come on. And uh, Gordon shot the picture and myself and my crew assisted him. And, and it was just awe-inspiring to see that man work the camera. That That's the power of photography right there. And I would argue there are people now that are saying, I was able to assist Joe McNally one day. So it's kind of come full circle in that sense. Uh, images, links, all of that type stuff, they're in the blog post over at BehindTheShot.tv. But I want people to be able to to find you. So uh, what's your website? JoeMcNally.com. Real straightforward. Okay. Social media are all the same, right? Joe Mc, at Joe McNally Photo. Joe McNally Photo, yep. YouTube is just Joe McNally, and you're active on YouTube, so people should go subscribe to your YouTube channel. And then the real mm-hmm. deal, Field Notes from the Life of a Working Photographer, which I can't wait to get this thing because February 8th is when it comes out, but you can pre-order it now, and people should go to where? Well, you can go to either Rocky Nook, the publisher, rockynook.com, or, you know, hit your Amazon account and pre-order it. It is, you know, finally, you know, it's kind of global supply chain stuff. It uh, was delayed, but it is uh, out and available as of next week. So very happy about that. Well, congratulations on the book. Uh, I think it's just going to be amazing, and I can't wait to read this thing when it gets here. And thank you, Joe, so much for doing the show. I really, really appreciate it. Steve, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Great questions. And it's an honor to spend some time with you. Yeah, the pleasure, believe me, is all mine. Everybody go check out Joe. All the links are available at the uh, website, BehindTheShot.tv. If you want to find me, it's SteveBrazel.com for the portfolio stuff. Social media-wise, it's either at Steve Brazel or at BehindTheShotTV. And of course, if you're on YouTube, go down, hit subscribe, click the like button, hit every button you can find, hit the bell, anything you can find. And if you're watching or listening in a podcast app, again, available audio only or a video, uh, please do go to Apple, iTunes, wherever you get your podcasts, leave a review. It would be much appreciated. Make sure you join us next time as we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. (laughs) 